Welcome to this discussion of uh, ADME, otherwise known as absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. This is part of the medicinal chemistry course offered through the NCSSM online program. The main question we're trying to answer in this course is, or that any medicinal chemist wants to answer, is what makes a good drug? And clearly the simple or actually simplistic answer is we want some good, eye, good biological activity and we want the drug to be selective to hit the right target. In other words, we want the drug to go to the right place and do the right thing, fix whatever it is we're trying to fix, cure whatever disease we're trying to cure. So that's fundamentally what makes a good drug. And as you're starting to find out or have found out so far in this course, that's a, a very difficult thing to do is to make a good drug. And certainly the, some of the guiding principles uh, come from the uh, acronym ADMET, which stands for absorption, being able to get the drug absorbed, whether it's lipophilic or hydrophilic, getting the drug absorbed so it can get into the bloodstream, getting it distributed to the right place in the body, uh, getting the drug, the drugs are often metabolized and that's either a good thing or a bad thing as we'll talk about a little bit in this discussion. Uh, eventually we do want the drug to be excreted or eliminated and get, out, and get it out of the body and all drugs uh, are toxic uh, so we have to be able to figure out and deal with uh, what is the toxicity of any particular drug. So uh, the majority of this course really does focus on absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. And we've been spending most of our time so far with absorption. Now we're going to get, a, we're going to review a little bit of that, but also get into some of these other categories as well. Okay, uh, this slide is showing, again, the essential question here is in the bottom right-hand corner, which the question you're trying to ask is, does this compound work in man or in, in people? And the, by work, what we mean, of course, is cure the disease we're trying to do. The role of in silico, you see that up at the top of the screen, in silico means by computer. Uh, the role of computational ADME toxicology is to improve uh, the return on the investment. What this slide is showing here is it's, if you look starting with research, it takes four to five years to do your basic research on any particular compound uh, to decide if it's going to have some beneficial effect. It's very expensive. 30% of the drugs don't make it past this stage. As we get into the development uh, phase, we're looking at a, a, a half a trillion dollars, or excuse me, half a billion dollars to be able to uh, uh, figure out if a drug is going to work or not. We're looking at eight to 10 years of development time, and about 70% of the drugs are eliminated at this stage. And finally, we get to the market. You see a high failure rate there, 90%, uh, uh, that's probably a low number of drugs that actually start in the pipeline and the, and the ones that actually make it to the market. So being able to uh, use computers really will help a lot. All right, here's a uh, pretty nice schematic of absorption, distribution, and metabolism. So what you see in this uh, 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 graphic here on the left is you see the dose uh, coming through, uh, th through the, the blood system and uh, in this case, it's absorbing through the gut wall and going into the liver. And once it's through the liver, then it, that drug is what we, we would call bioavailable. And there are a number of things down the bottom there that we'll, we'll mention in this discussion, but talk more about when we get into the um, discussion of pharmacokinetics, things like volume of distribution, clearance and absorption, and all of these uh, uh, influence uh, oral bioavailability and basically we're trying to answer the question how much drug do we need to give the patient to be able to do what it is we need it we need to do so uh, you'll get a little taste of this now but we'll talk about this a lot more later on some of the pharmacokinetic parameters are things like oral bioavailability the fraction of dose that enters the blood circulation and this is after what we call the first pass metabolism through the liver Almost all drugs will go through the liver before they uh, get out into the bloodstream. And what often happens to drugs in the liver is that they are metabolized or changed into some other structure 
And again, this metabolism may be good, it may be actually we wanted to do that, or it may be bad, it may uh, ruin the drug or make it uh, less bioavailable. But this first pass metabolism, almost all drugs undergo this first pass metabolism and are changed in the process of making their way through the liver. So oral bioavailability is defined as the fraction of dose that enters the blood circulation after the first pass metabolism in the liver. And you can see that in the graphic there. Uh, absorption is the fraction of dose that passes through some membrane, the, the intestinal wall, the gut wall, um, whatever the case may be. Clearance is the amount of blood that is clear uh, per unit time, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Uh, that's a mathematical value that is specific to each drug, and we'll talk about that when we get into pharmacokinetics. And volume of distribution, or V sub D, is the concentration of drug in the blood, and again, we'll talk about that in great detail when we look at pharmacokinetics. So pharmacokinetic parameters are, are values or numbers that you're going to see popping up fairly regularly from now on as we talk about how to get the drug absorbed, distributed, and metabolized uh, to get it to the right place to do the right thing. Okay, you've seen, uh, uh, been working with this a little bit already. Uh, absorption, of course, being able to get the drug through, uh, through a membrane and you know by now that the molecular weight has to be left less than 500 grams per mole. Uh, typically these are nonpolar molecules. You've, you've learned a little bit about the Lipinski rules, uh, number of hydrogen donors, number of hydrogen acceptors, the log P value. And what you should also see from this slide is there's different types of ways for, uh, for drugs to get through the membrane. There are uh, not only can it just absorb, but there are different types of transport mechanisms, paracellular, transcellular, Callier-mediated transport, and what we call PGP uh, effects, PGP uh, standing for plasma glycoprotein, and you'll learn a little bit about that uh, in, in this week's lab. So again, you've, you've had some experience now with log P's and solubilities and hypo... Uh, hydrophilic and lipophilic, so you should be getting some sense of the, the magnitude of the challenge of just getting the drug absorbed and into the right place in the body. Uh, here's another graphic that sort of tries to show this again. You've got uh, this membrane you've got to go through. Uh, C1 and C2 represent a difference in concentration between uh, water and membranes and there is a, uh, a variety of mathematical equations that we can use to predict how well the drug will get through this membrane, something called a penetration rate, and you see the partition info, that's the log P value, A is the effective surface area of the membrane, so there are a variety of, of uh, more complicated mathematics than what we've done so far that really talk about how the drug gets through this membrane. And all of these have to do with, uh, the arrows are pointing to it over there, all these things have to do with lipophilicity, the molecular weight, the hydrogen bonding, the hydrogen donors, hydrogen acceptors, all those Lipinski values that we've talked about already. Um, and this slide leads into that, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Uh, you should know by now that absorption requires these molecules to, to break apart and that gets increasingly difficult with an increasing number of hydrogen bonds. So as we have more hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, that makes the challenge of getting the drug into the body even more challenging. Uh, you've seen uh, so far in some of the talks and in one of the labs that there is a, an effect that pH has in getting the drug into the body. Uh, you've seen that when I put the drug into the stomach, um, it, it ionizes and that will influence whether or not it is lipophilic or hydrophilic. You've learned that there's two environments in the body, uh, the lipid environment and an aqueous environment, and depending on where we're putting the drug, uh, that will influence how well the drug gets into the body. Uh, this slide here is showing that the pH of, say, the stomach is uh, somewhere between 3 and 7 after you've eaten, and the pH of the stomach is 1.4 to 2.1 or so if you haven't had anything to eat. And those of you who've taken drugs before, you might recall that some drugs say, 
you shouldn't take this drug on an empty stomach. You should make sure you eat first, or they'll say, uh, don't eat before you take this drug. And all that has to do with changing the pH in the, in the stomach, in this case, um, for a particular drug. I have values there for some of the other large intestine, small intestine, duodenum. So uh, you see these values change depending on what part of the uh, body the drug is being uh, inserted into. Okay. Uh, Lipinski's rule of five by now. Okay. Uh, you should know, be getting pretty familiar with this by now. Uh, he did this work in 97, selected about 2,000 orally active drugs from the World Drug Index. And he says that these things distribute poorly when the, absorb when the absorption is, uh, you've got a molecular weight greater than 500, you've got a log P greater than 5, you have the number of hydrogen bond, numbers is, bond donors is greater than 5, and the number of hydrogen bond acceptors is greater than 10. So uh, we want all of our numbers to be less than these, less than 500, less than 5, less than 5, and less than 10, uh, so that we have good absorption. And that's Lipinski's rule of 5. Um, looking at these things in terms of if I look at uh, absorption of a drug into a rat, uh, these rules are all based on, again, log P's, molecular weights, hydrogen bond donors, hydrogen bond acceptors. These are all things that really just decide whether or not I've got uh, good absorption um, in, in an organism. In this case, we're showing you data for a rat. But there's also things like the polar surface area. Uh, the number of rotatable bonds. You experienced rotatable bonds in the very first lab that you did. Okay? We gave you some polar surface numbers, but we didn't have you calculate those. And basically, these numbers are all called physicochemical properties or physiological chemical properties. And these things largely determine bioavailability. So you can look at these numbers and you can calculate these numbers. You can estimate these numbers. And you've done all of those things for many of these. And based on your predictions, estimations, calculations, you really can determine or have a good idea of what the bioavailability might be. And again, bioavailability means that the drug is available for therapeutic uses. Okay, a little bit about distribution here. The most important organ, of course, is the brain. And if we want the drug to act on the central nervous system, it's got to cross the blood-brain barrier, or the BBB. And that's what this picture here is showing. This is a picture of the blood-brain barrier, a little schematic of that. And once again, distributing, getting these drugs distributed to the right place, we really have to look at these physicochemical properties or these physiological, physiological chemical properties. Again, these things are what's important. And a lot of this is, is influenced by different transport mechanisms, which I alluded to in an earlier slide, one of them being a uh, what's called PGP or plasma glycoprotein transport. So basically think about it this way, that there are these proteins in the body to which a drug can attach. And these proteins will help these drugs be transported through these various membranes. And there's different types of transport mechanisms. There's some mechanisms that actually in, that prevent the drug from getting through, those are inhibitors. There are transport mechanisms that aid the drug in getting through uh, the, the, the membrane. So there's a whole variety of different type of transport mechanisms. We'll talk about some of them, uh, but until you've had a good solid course in biochemistry, we won't go into them in tremendous amount of detail. Okay, so here's some sample data. This is uh, PGP data for aspirin. Um, and what we're showing you here, this comes from the ADME uh, web boxes page. So for aspirin, you see, uh, in this case, the probability that uh, PGP inhibits the transport of this is pretty low. The probability that uh, the, the, the PGP helps this uh, drug get transported is pretty low, 0 0.005. So basically, we can measure uh, the ability of this drug to get transported uh, through a membrane or to be prevented from being transported through a membrane. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that data when we get into some of the issues on pharmacokinetics in week eight or nine or so. OK, talking a little bit about metabolism and leading into excretion. As I said earlier in this talk, all drugs are metabolized. All drugs 
are changed from the chemical structure that they are in when they enter the body to the chemical structure that they end when they leave the body. Anything that we put in the body is typically called a xenobiotic or a, a foreign compound. So anything that doesn't currently exist naturally in the body is often known as a xenobiotic. And what this graphic is showing you here is there's a couple pathways for, um, for compounds. So for example, starting on the left-hand side, some xenobiotics will accumulate or get stored in the body fat or even in the bone. And eventually the ones, they will eventually come out of this uh, storage of body fat or bone um, and undergo what's called phase one metabolism, uh, where they are either activated biologically or inactivated biologically. So you see the words biointeractivation or inactivation. And for those of you who've had a little bit of chemistry, the phase one uh, chemistry that's happening there is typically an oxidation reaction or a reduction reaction. So redox happens, that's why we study this in general chemistry. Or it might be the compound might be hydrolyzed um, or uh, uh, broken apart through the action of, of water. Okay? And once it undergoes that phase one metabolism, then the drug will go to the excretion stage and it can either be excreted through the kidneys, renal, or through the, the bile system. Okay? Um, and all of that, and then it gets excreted out of the body. Lipophilic drugs, going over to the uh, sort of the middle of the chart there, don't accumulate in the body fat or the bone. They go right to phase one metabolism. And then they also, the polar molecules of those will leave phase one metabolism and go into phase two metabolism where they are inactivated uh, biologically. And this undergoes what's called a conjugation reaction. And then again, they are excreted. Polar molecules uh, go directly to phase two metabolism and hydrophilic uh, molecules typically uh, go right on through and just eventually get, get excreted. So this is a uh, very simple, actually a very simplistic uh, picture of uh, different pathways for metabolism and excretion. And we'll spend a little bit more time on this as we go through the rest of the course. Okay, so uh, how does this all happen? Um, the primary way that this happens, and here we're looking at lipophilic metabolites, okay? Metabolites meaning something that's been changed. So a lipophilic compound uh, typically will be changed through uh, the, the interaction with what's known as an enzyme. An enzyme is a chemical that changes uh, how it changes the structure of a molecule. And the primary enzyme that we're dealing with here comes from a family of, of enzymes known as cytochrome P450. Okay. And there's different types of processes that can happen with there. And so these lipophilic uh, compounds undergo uh, interaction with cytochrome P450 and they will now go into phase one metabolism, which again is mostly a redox or oxidation reaction, get converted to polar metabolites, and then undergo phase two conjugation. So here you see we're adding the polar metabolite to gluthi uh, glutathione or water or uh, glucor um, glucuronate or sulfate or acetate or methyl. So we are conjugating or adding compounds to these polar metabolites and eventually changing them into hydrophilic metabolites, which then get excreted. So this is what's known in metabolism as a met uh, metabolic pathway. You see we're going from one stage, we're undergoing a process, we're going to the next stage, we're undergoing a process, and finally we get to some terminal phase. Um, this is called a metabolic pathway. And this graphic here shows the metabolic pathway for codeine. And you'll have a chance to uh, We'll go through this during the uh, uh, mandatory, the, the, the weekly uh, Illuminate session. And what you see here is, for example, starting on the left-hand side on the top, all this happens in the liver cell. So you can see the words liver cell over on the top right. Uh, starting, say, with codeine, okay, 
all, all these interactions with these circles here, uh, for example, CYP3A4, these are enzymes, uh, genetic enzymes in the body that are uh, metabolizing these drugs into something else. So, for example, you see codeine is metabolized by this enzyme CYP3A4 into something called norcodeine. Okay? You see codeine is also metabolized by UGT-287 into something called codeine 6 uh, uh, gluconoride. All right, so all of these things get metabolized. Codeine can also be metabolized into morphine, okay, which undergoes its own process and eventually ends up being eliminated through the bile system. Uh, we have, we know pretty well the structures of these uh, enzymes like cytochrome P450, and uh, you see some, uh, you see an example here of what this protein looks like and we first crystallized this in the year 2000 from, uh, from uh, rabbit studies and we'll spend some time when we get to the section on pharmacogenetics really looking at protein structures in a little bit more detail. The structures that are most important for humans are the CYP2C9, the 3A4, and the 2D6. Here's another picture of the cytochrome P450 substrate and or, or uh, structure and here you so what you see on the substrate is the uh, uh, you see actually the protein with all these little ribbon thingies in there and if you look real hard in the middle you can see where there's a drug in there and the catalytic center is what is what's known as a heme center so what that orange dot is on the graphic on the right that's an iron atom okay so we'll look at that in great detail when we get to the section on protein structure. Uh, cytochrome P450 is a large family of proteins. There's a whole bunch of them. And we usually talk about them by, uh, we talk about proteins by family. This is the CYP family. The subfamily is the 3A uh, subfamily and the individual protein is number four. So, and if you can look, if you can sort of squint at that graphic on the left hand side, you see that the uh, which ones are involved in drug metabolism. Um, we're going to be really looking at the CYP2D6 uh, protein. You see it up at the top there. It's about the fourth one down from the top. And that's the enzyme that we're uh, going to be looking at a fair amount in this, in this week's activity. Okay, and the last part of ADME is, uh, or ADMET, is the prediction of toxicity. And what you want to be able to do there is we have to look at the chemistry, the structure, the reaction mechanisms. Uh, we have to look at some of the uh, biological activity, specifically the side effects. And all of that comes together through the use of QSAR, which you spent time on last week. And we apply statistics and analytical methods to all of these, all of this data to try to be able to predict the toxicity of any particular compound. And we use either expert or rule-based systems, or in your case, we use QSAR or cor um, 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 correlation methods to be able to, to predict the toxicity of these particular drugs. And here's an example QSAR method, and you did this in the lab this week. So, for example, we take a lot of uh, data like uh, the LD50 or lethal dose 50 data on mice studies, and we take knowledge from the literature and we use decision trees and we use QSAR methods to come up with a QSAR equation. Uh, in this case, I'm predicting the log one over LD50 uh, for a particular compound to see, uh, be able to predict what its LD50 might be. And so you have some experience now with uh, QSAR techniques to be able to predict properties of drugs like uh, the toxicity. And we talked about a little bit last week that if the R value is, uh, usually we want this to be something of, along the lines of 0.9 or higher. Uh, depending on the drug you're looking at, it could be uh, 0.8 or higher, but those are the statistics you need for all these drug compounds. Okay, if there's any questions, we'll see you during the Illuminate sessions. Thank you very much.